What's up, guys? Welcome to Running Things Season 2, Episode 2. My name is Riley. I'm your host. I'm also the editor over at tempojournal.com. Thanks for being with us today. Massive episode. We are heading over to Oregon to check in with Bowman Track Club athlete Marielle Hall. It's going to be fantastic chatting with her. If you checked out last week's episode with Shelby Houlihan, thank you so much for getting involved in that, whether you listen on the podcast or whether you're watching on YouTube. Before we get into the interview with Marielle, though, I want to talk a little bit about probably the big news we're all looking forward to right now, which is the London Marathon coming up on October the 4th. Of course, it is an elites-only race this year on a drastically modified course. We've got pretty much a 2K loop rather than the point-to-point course that we've seen in the London Marathon traditionally. Everybody's talking about Kipchoge versus Bekele going to be an incredible, incredible showdown. I kind of wish it was on the like the OG legit course, but we'll take what we can get right now. Hey, um, of course, all the hype and all the fanfare and, and occasional occasional running fans know a lot more about Elliot Kipchoge than they do about Bekele. But um, for anybody who has been around for a while, knows of course Bekele probably the greatest distance runner of all time. Um, and his run in Berlin where he he kind of got dropped and then came back and, and missed the world record by only two seconds was pretty phenomenal. So looking forward to that. I don't think they're going to have it all their own way though as well. There's a bunch of really talented Ethiopians, like a bunch of 204, 205 guys in the race as well, including uh, Mosinet Geremu, who I think finished second last year, um, insanely talented runner. So I can't imagine that these guys are just going to be happy to give up the spotlight uh, on race day for Kipchoge and Bekele. It's their only race of the year as well. They're going to be out to do as much as they can on the day. So super excited to see how that unfolds. I just hope that BBC do the right thing and make the telecasts uh, available to all of us. On the women's side, I mean, it's any race that Bridget Cosguy is in is kind of her race, right? Like, uh, obviously shattered, shattered uh, Paula Radcliffe's world record in Chicago last year. And, you know, she herself said after the race, she can run faster. So um, it's hard, It's to be honest, it's hard to see anybody really challenging Cosguy. I, I'm a big fan of Viv Chariot. I hope she runs well, but I think this is Cosguy's race to do what she will with. And, and it will be exciting to see how fast she can go. Um, I'm not quite sure on the pacemakers for Cosguy, but um, be interested to see that over the next couple of weeks. Of course, on the Australian side, we have Sinead Diver and Ali Pashley in the women's race. Uh, in the men's race, we have Jack Rayner, Brett Robinson, and Julian Spence, Ballarat hometown hero. So looking forward to seeing how those guys go. We will be bringing you guys a bunch of London content during race week as well, chats with the Aussie athletes and uh, a few few little snippets from some London personalities as well. So really looking forward to that last week of September into the first week of October. The one thing I found interesting about like the London Marathon, it's it's probably the best run marathon in the world. They spend the most money. They get the best athletes. You know, it's a whole spectacle and they do it really well. The one thing I, I don't know if I'm vibing though, I am a Mo Farah fan. Um, of course, he's got his hour record coming up early September in Brussels. There's a great piece on Tempo right now about that record attempt. So go and check that out. But Mo Farah is pacing um, part of the marathon. And, you know, in the press release that came out announcing the fields, that got almost as much uh, space in the press release as the women's field. It's cool that Mo's pacing and it'll be funny to see that on the day, but it doesn't deserve that much um that much of the press coverage or that much airtime really like it's the race is not about the paces never has been never will be so i thought that was a bit strange anyway guys looking forward to london but for now let's get straight into this interview with marielle hall all right guys running things season two episode two big names only on the running things podcast and today is no exception we have Rio Olympian, 10,000 metre god, Bowman Track Club athlete, Marielle Hall on the show. Marielle, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's amazing to have you on today. Uh, let's let's start by talking a little bit. I understand you guys have, have just come off, off season, so you've had a little bit of a break. Um, how was your off season? What did you get up to? It's been good. It looks a little different for every person, um, especially this year, maybe not as much um, grounds grounds to travel, but a little fortunate to get to see family for for two weeks there. And now back in Portland, different uh, different city, same state, 
spending a little bit of time in Bend checking out the trails and just kind of setting the reset button for the year, wanting to do it in a different, a little bit different of a location, um, but still prioritize the running and Bend is a really great city for that. So, yeah. Your, uh, your family is East Coast based, is that right? Yes. Yeah. have family all up and down the East Coast. So haven't gotten anyone to replant uh, their their roots on the <laughs> West Coast, which which would be helpful for me. But um, it is always nice to get to go back and kind of um, East Coast is just so congested. You can, you know, get to like two states in the same amount of time it takes to drive halfway across Oregon um, or a lot of the West Coast. Uh, so I'm grateful that at least we're all congested on that side so I can um, see a lot of people without doing too much work. So, yeah. <laughs> now, what is your, what does your running look like in off season? Because I, you know, I look at a bunch of the Bowman athletes and everybody's kind of different in how much or how often they're running. What's your, uh, what's your preference for off season running? Uh, it's usually just putting emphasis on the slow build back. I think just, as many years as, as you continue to do this, starting from high school through college, now professional, you know, it's really easy. You can pretty much jump back into hour plus runs without, you know, completely debilitating things. And so I, I think it's just practicing patience. And even though you can, you know, maybe skip the adding five miles a week and, and kind of the baby steps that, that we all learn when we're, we're trying to build uh, endurance and strength. Uh, would be easy to skip those steps, but just trying to remember that that that's what keeps you healthy and, and not really rushing the beginning phases. So for me, it's just, you know, starting out about running 40 minutes every day, not doubling. Uh, maybe I'll do one longer run throughout the week, but but really just singles, maybe look taking a closer dive into some of the little things that I can be doing, stretching more. Um, some of the things that unfortunately get maybe a little bit lost in the shuffle when you're doing bigger mileage, but um, love to start the year off on the good foot. So yeah, that's what it looks like for me. Are you a uh, are you a mobility person? Like, are you one of those people before a track workout you're doing a heap of different drills, or is that something you kind of dread having to do during the season? Uh, I I feel like I'm definitely an active stretcher. Like my warm up is pretty dynamic. I'm not a big like the sedentary activation stuff. It doesn't really work for me. Like, I'll still feel stale going out the door, but like having a more dynamic warm up is something that I think has been useful for me. I can't say I don't know the science behind you know which one's better, and um, everyone's routine's a little bit different depending on their body. But I I really like the mobility stuff. And I think it's pretty effective for me. So that's kind of what I prefer to do, um, as a warm up before easy runs, workouts, um, not really the like sit down and roll. Cause I'll probably just sit on the roller. <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, but, uh, again, that doesn't mean it's not an effective tool. Just for me personally, I have to like be engaged in it. So something that's a little bit more dynamic. Sure. Um, Hey, I'd love to go, it's, it feels like a lifetime ago now, I'd love to go all the way back to Doha 2019 with you. Um, I've watched that 10,000 meter race a bunch of times. Um, your run was, was um, I mean, you finished in eighth place behind the East Africans and, and Sifan Hassan, and I think uh, Susan Crummins maybe got you on the line, but it, it, was, it was an incredibly strong run. It was obviously a massive PR for you. Um, what did you take away from that? Because you did so much of the work in that kind of that second group. Like you were pretty much at the front of that group the whole way. And it, obviously it paid off at the end because you, you out kicked um, most of the competition. What did you get from that run? Um, I, I mean, a lot of things, but I, I think just can the, the thing I think sticks out the most for me is, is having like urgency in training and in racing Sometimes you kind of play the ranking game of like, okay, I should be behind this person. You're kind of like finding your mini pack within the race and instead of really like exploiting the opportunity for all that it can give to you. <laughs> and um, I think I was just like, it coincided, like the year was just, it was 
it didn't feel extremely long, but it, we didn't race, like we didn't race after USA's it's definitely getting a little bit of cabin fever, like wanting to race and just do something. And, and I just remember thinking during that race or before that was like, okay, this is, this is it before, <laughs> you know, there's not anything to come after this. There's, you know, there's not, I don't, I'm not doing anything before it. I really, even, I just want to be, you know, brave enough and confident enough in, in the work that I put in to take a chance and, you know, maybe do some more of the leading and, and not worry so much about, you know, what's going to happen if, if I, you know, go ahead of this person that I'm not supposed to be ahead of, or what's going to happen if I, <laughs> you know, do something stupid. So I do something stupid, like at least I'll know and, um, have, have taken that chance instead of kind of just, um, letting the race happen to me instead of being like an active participant in it. Um, I think that's like really what I wanted to get out of it. And, um, I, that, that, I think that was what maybe spurred some of the, like, I don't, you know, leading's not my favorite, <laughs> but in, for that, learn just learning how to be situational. Like you don't have to lead every time, but sometimes the situation calls for it. Um, and that was one of those days where it was like, I really, I need this opportunity for myself. And um, just because it is just that, like a really great opportunity. So why not uh, take advantage of that? It's, um, it's fascinating to hear you talk about, you know, sometimes getting stuck in that mentality of, well, I'm not supposed to be ahead of this person and, and I, sh you know, what if I go out too hard or I make the wrong move? Because I think uh, for a lot of amateur runners, that's certainly that kind of, I don't know if it's self-doubt, but that's something that we all experience a lot. But we just, I think we just imagine that uh, you guys, the pros, you go out there and it's just about, you know, you have all the confidence in the world and it's just executing um, the race. But it's really interesting to hear that you kind of have those those inner conversations as well. Yeah, no, like as if it looks put together on race day, it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it, it's not. <laughs> so if it feels like it seems like we all have figured it out and, and know what we're doing, it's really more or less just a giant experiment. And I think embracing that more is helpful because you do put a little bit of that pressure on yourself. Like I should know what I'm doing, but like I should have this figured out. I shouldn't feel this way. Like, but um, I think like the exciting part about or the interesting part about a lot of professionals, um, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but for myself is, you know, you still go through all those things. It's just the decision and the choice to, um, you know, want to see the most out of yourself, want to get the most out of yourself that you kind of learn to put it back. You learn how to manage those thoughts and, and learn how to navigate them and realize that they are just thoughts and, you know, you're in control of those things. And, um, I think that's one of the things is like, you know, talking, giving legs, my legs a pep talk is just like reminding them I'm in charge, you know, they don't get to just decide what to do. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really just, I think taking more ownership of, of of the things you can control. And I heard that a lot this year, I'm sure a lot of people training out there, um, a lot of things we couldn't control, but a lot of things that we could effort and attitude. And, um, those are the things you just try and, you know, those have that dialogue with yourself, um, to try and fight off the negative thoughts that we all have. Uh, you said something, I think, I think it was probably just before Doha last year, you were talking about and I'm sure you get asked this a lot, your preference between the 5,000 meters and the 10,000 meters. And you said at the time that the 5,000 just felt more familiar to you. You kind of knew what, what, a, what a 5k race was going to feel like, whereas the 10 was still a little bit, you know, you were still kind of working through that. Has that changed at all for you now? I, I mean, it's still so far in between, right? Like even this year, I won't, I have got the opportunity to run a 10k in a full calendar year so it's like no matter what I'm fully prepared to step on the line for the next 10k and to be a you know a very hard difficult you can't really mimic that um feeling very well in practice I think you the shorter the distance I uh, I feel like the closer you can get to um kind of replicating the at least getting touches of like what that pain is. Um, but, but I feel like for the 10 K there's just, 
um, my experiences have been so, so different that, that it's hard <laughs> to be like in practice and say like, oh, that like, that's the 10K, like that's the feeling. Um, whereas the 5K, it's like I've ran more, we've done a lot more efforts catered to that, um, to that event, just because again, there's more opportunities to race it. So, so I feel like I, that becomes more familiar, but, um, I also, um, one of the reasons why I like the 10K is, is that it isn't something that I, there, it just feels like there's more room, room for growth. Like there's more, um, I haven't been in a very many, um, race scenarios. So it's like every time it's going to be, um, something new. And, and when you've been running for, you know, I've been running since middle school for there to still be new opportunities in the sport and like new ways to like see myself and, and, um, to see competition that's, that's exciting and kind of just grateful that there's still ways to make, um, training and racing exciting because it is pretty monotonous, but I feel like the 10 K it still has kind of, uh, an elusive thing around it where I'm like, I don't really know what this is, <laughs> but, um, that's, that's kind of a cool thing. Speaking of new opportunities, you ran a, you ran a 15 K road race in, uh, I'm going to say Jacksonville in March, uh, which you won national title, I believe. Uh, was that your first, have you raced a 15 K on the road before? How was that experience? Uh, no, that was my first 15 K. Um, it was, it was, it was different. <laughs> I think it was, it was it's just, um, hard to like know where you are, <laughs> like gauge pace. I think I had a, a lot of fun with it because I just kind of like kept pressing and like kept trying to go fast as best I could. And you don't really like the track is so much more controlled. Um, like you, I know what happens every time I come around, you know, like I have a split. I, um, especially, I just feel like my experience on Bowerman, we've like really honed into being like methodical pace sounds, you know, it's like, that's, you get a gold star at practice if you hit pace and if you don't, you know, like you're, it's, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> so I feel like I've, you become really obsessive about pace and, and being good at that, like finding that rhythm and like finding that red line. And, um, the roads was just like much more explore, like exploratory. I, I felt like it was, you're just kind of like, you don't, know where you are like you're you can't you're not you're gauging the efforts solely on yourself not on like the feedback of the lap and um people around you so that that was cool and, and different um but I definitely felt like I was just like floating out there like I was like I don't know what's happening <laughs> um <laughs> but it was cool it was, it was different and again always really grateful to have new experiences in a sport that I've been like practicing for such a long time uh, something that I, again, I know you've been asked before, but anytime I'm talking with my buddies, especially buddies in the States, um, about women's marathoning and, and U S women's marathoning, there's, there's a couple of friends who always say, yeah, but wait until Marielle Hall becomes a marathoner. Like there seems to be like a lot of anticipation that someday you're going to make the, the leap into marathoning. And you obviously have so much, uh, so much career still ahead of you in, in the 5k and the 10k, but, um, does the, mar does the marathon hold some appeal for you? And, and after doing a, a longer road race, does it, does it get more interesting or less interesting to you? No, I definitely like, I'll, I'll catch myself doing a quick visualization mid run of like being on the roads and what that would feel like. And it does, it does excite me. Um, I think I'm also terrified just cause I've seen <laughs> Amy, Shalane, like Bumby, CD, like Chris, like I've seen them just like absolutely exhausted <laughs> and just like shells of humans. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I feel like it's like I see the races, I'm watching trials, I'm watching Chicago, New York for like I'm watching all of these two hour projects and I'm like absolutely ecstatic about the opportunity and like being a part of that. And then I see the training and I'm like, that <laughs> looks <laughs> that looks catastrophic. Uh but um it, it is exciting. I think I just me to continue to wrap my mind around, um, what, uh, what it's going to take from me, especially the way our, our team is. It's, I've definitely benefited a ton from 
sharing the workload. And um, right now, I, I think if that would, it would be a big solo pursuit to do like w- within the confines of the team, which is a nut, like, um, you know, I'm not, uh, I've heard horror stories from Shalane as well about how hard it is to train for the marathon alone. So I have these two like angel, I have the angel devil situation where it's like, I'm excited about it. I see like, I'm planning, like I would love to tackle, you know, then another, a new Olympic cycle with, the idea of running the marathon. Um, but it's like, you kind of, I'm also like trying to look around me and see, I'm like, who can I convince to train with me for this? Uh, <laughs> but um, it is exciting. I think it's, it's a really cool aspect of the running community and world that I would, would really like to, you know, tip my toes into and, and see what I could do. Um, but yes, those are, those are, that's what I'm weighing the excitement versus, you know, the work. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, Marielle, let's talk a little bit about the 2020 season as uh, as kind of strange and interrupted as it was. Um, a bunch of Bowman intra squad meets, and you you obviously found yourself running, um, you know, a lot shorter distances than you used to, 600s, 800s, etc. Uh, mm-hmm. What do you take away from a season like that? Um, again, like a ton of things. Uh, I feel like everyone has basket full of lessons they learned this year about others and themselves but uh, I guess mostly is just um I mean I I don't know if this is it's a personal takeaway but I, I feel really encouraged about like the discipline that is like within the people that are around me I feel like really encouraged by that I learn a lot from that And, um, I'm just like very appreciative of this, like unwavering mentality, like, (laughs) um, mentality that is, um, like within so many people that I interact on a day-to-day basis. Uh, I think it can be, you can feel very selfish and, um, like small, small minded when you're kind of doing this, that kind of pursuit alone, it feels like extremely isolating and you kind of question whether you're prioritizing the right things. But I think being in this group environment where you've made um, like the sacrifice and the discipline and and the injury and the hardships, like making all of that, like have a bigger purpose and meaning. I think I've been um, just like appreciative to be surrounded by that, that type of uh, energy, I guess you could say. Um, also, just I, I can say that I, I definitely feel still proud of I, I definitely I committed to the work every day. Like I woke up and re- did my runs by myself. I, you know, I got to practice and, and did the things that I needed to do when, when we weren't meeting as a group. And, you know, I, I did the step ups on the table, like did the PT in the apartment, you know, like I feel proud to say that like I, I did, I still found like, nobility in the work and even if it didn't pan out for me to be able to necessarily race the things that I felt um I wanted to or in the way that I wanted to um I still it's kind of you have like an underlying a little bit of giddiness to know like this is still something that I um find important and and the work that I was doing it may have not like manifested in the way that I wanted it to but I think it says something about um, I'll just like, just give myself a pat. <laughs> I feel like it says something about me and that I feel proud of that. Like, um, you, f- you don't always get opportunities to like, see yourself like working through things. And I think this year was very much like, um, getting to like, see, I got to like really see myself, um, commit to things even like there was no shiny prize. There was, you know, there was, there was no, um, you know, nobody cheering me on there. There was, there was nothing, there was quote unquote, no real incentive. Um, but I still felt very, um, like attached and, uh, committed to, to the work and just wanting, um, willing for it to show up in a different type of way and in a different time. And not always when you want it to, not always like how you imagine. 
Um, so I, I guess that was a lesson slash just like a little bit of validation for um, the commitment you put towards something that it's should it you can't predict how or when or why it'll show up. Um, but um, if you can like learn to just like appreciate what you're doing and, and find um, uh, just like enjoyment in that, that that's that's enough and. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know if I really answered that, but um, I, I guess mostly just things that um, really highlighted the year for me was seeing the discipline and the people around me and, and then also feeling proud that I continue to ask that of myself, even though things weren't, um, you know, it wasn't the picture perfect year that um, that you hope it to be. I think that's actually like people will love to hear that because that's very relatable for amateur runners, right? Like we've also had, you know, not the Olympics, but we've had all of our races taken away from us. So mm-hmm. um, I know people are going through various levels of motivation when, you know, the big shiny goal at the end is taken away, but there is so much to be said for what you can learn about yourself and the nobility of still going through with something because you love it and it makes you better, not just because there's a, there's a PR or a a race medal at the end. So it's really Mm -hmm. interesting to hear. Um, you guys went back to, you you went to altitude at the start of the year. And then I think in June, you went back to park city in Utah. Mm -hmm. That looked amazing. That, that Mm -hmm. looks like what all of us wish we could do, right? It just looks like a couple of weeks of, uh, of nice sunshine, a beautiful track, a lot of running with your friends. Uh, is that what altitude camps are like or what's, what's the reality? A little bit of both. I mean, particularly this year, I think all of us were very aware that this was an extreme privilege to be in a situation where we could go to the mountains, train, and, and then create um, race scenarios to um, align with all the work that we've put in for the year. Um, so, so I think that, that, that part of it's there. It's like every day we're on a run and everyone's just like, wow, okay, this is, this is beautiful. (laughs) This is, um, you know, like, I'm so happy to be out of this shelter in place, this like quarantine Mm -hmm. mentality, um, this kind of, uh, this really cloak of fear that was over (laughs) the city and like (laughs) everyone. And I think it was really, um, just nice to, uh, kind of, um, be with your team again, fall into similar patterns that I was just, I think, comforting for, for everyone, for a lot of people. Um, but it's also very difficult, um, again, particularly this year to, um, be separated from like the angst and (laughs) the difficulties that, um, the world is, is facing, uh, to kind of, you know, re- I re-quarantine yourself in, in your, um, in a scenario that's best for you. Um, that it's kind of hard to balance, to balance if that is, um, how, how to feel about that. <laughs> you know, it feels good. Obviously I want to be in beautiful trails training and with my friends, like that sounds incredible, but I do feel like it was also very guilt ridden. Um, again, I had a ton of family on the East coast friends, family in New York, and like dealing with a completely, you know, I'm like embarrassed to tell people I went outside today because there are like, I have family members who like literally didn't go outside for months. <laughs> um, so I, I think that that was really difficult. And, and then again, even in a typical year, you're dealing with emotions of preparing for, you know, to try and lay yourself out on the line and, and kind of have all of your dreams and aspirations come true. We're dealing with um, the sadness of, you know, what would have been collectively as a group. Um, we're also, um, everyone's hyper competitive, you know, you're, so you're, you're always dealing with those variables, normal emotions, like <laughs> just imagine yourself as a normal human being and then, <laughs> being like put into this, uh, hyper, you know, a stressful competitive, uh, um, environment and like what that would, uh, what that would do to you. Not every day, but on occasion, you know, everybody has a bad day up there. So (laughs) it is, um, a really 
a really incredible experience to be able to um, really like hone in on your craft and, and train with your friends for a month and then like go try and tear their heads off a couple weeks later. Like <laughs> I think there's like a nice little competitive slash friendly uh, um, energy there that I um, that I'm grateful for. I, I think it's I feel like we have a good balance of being able to assert who we are and what we want without you know, having to feel like we have to, um, kind of like walk down our ambitions and dreams just because that may mean the person next to us, uh, (laughs) doesn't get their ambitions or dreams. I think it's just, um, a mutual respect that everyone's working super hard and is going to just like lay it out there. And, you know, I get to see people doing it, um, doing the work and, and, you know, really putting themselves out there. So it's like, if I have to lose to anyone, I guess you'll, you'll do kind of thing. <laughs> um, speaking of that, that sort of group, you know, competitiveness, competitiveness, but also camaraderie, you spoke before about, um, you know, you get the gold star at practice. If you guys, if you nail the pacing, right. And we've all been in situations where, you might be feeling really good and the temptation is to, is to, you know, push the pace a little bit. I imagine, you know, we've all seen those Bowman workout videos where there's six or eight of you taking turns to lead That's reps. Back, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. On a good day, is there ever that, like, it, it, it must be hard to not get carried away and kind of just, just, just dial that pace up a little bit and get a little bit competitive. Is that difficult? Yeah. I, I mean, there's parts of the season where it absolutely gets taped, like, there is no pace. <laughs> um, but then I think everyone's personality is just a little different. Like I personally feel a lot of power in like knowing I could like really stomp on someone if I wanted to, but not <laughs> like, I think that's more exciting almost than just like gassing yourself, you know, <laughs> so much that that you like you you're tearing apart the person next to you and yourself like I think I find a lot of like solace and just power in being like you know just like feeling that like ball of energy building while you're running and it's like yeah I could but I'm like I'm just gonna like I'm gonna do it I'm supposed to do today and maybe that means like I'm running a little bit faster than normal but it's like I could go way faster if I really wanted to I really like that balance of being like I know this person sucking wind behind me but it's like I'm gonna be a good person and also for myself (laughs) you know show some restraint because I think in racing um like that's a really hard part for me is like when I feel good, I want to go. Like when I feel bad, I want to go the other direction. Like those are my, (laughs) those are my two emotions, but it's like really like particularly talking about 10 K or roads. It's like really being able to like hold on to your cards for as long as possible. Um, and I think, uh, that that's not always like my, sometimes I'm just like you, when you feel good, you got to just take advantage because the way that races fluctuate, the way the practice goes, like you may not feel good in a couple of minutes. Like you may not feel good in a few reps, like just take advantage, take advantage. But, um, sometimes like also learning how to take restraint and like, um, realizing what that feels like. So when you're in a race and you like that, just like each lap, you just build confidence of like, okay, I'm going to have this, you know, thing to unleash at the end. Um, and I think that's like really what will like what makes me feel good when I leave practice was like, okay, like there's some days, yeah, of course, like you love to rip and that feels great. But there's some days where you walk away and you're just like, if I wanted to, but I didn't. (laughs) (laughs) What, what about, um, and I'm sure like everyone's, everyone's had it. What about being on the receiving end of one of those? Like, you know, you might be, you might be in that, in that, that train and, uh, feeling someone like Shelby just kind of pulling away, like testing the pace a little bit, like, that must be the other side of the coin, right? Like, come on, don't do this today. Yeah. I ne- like, I never, I, I just think it's, it's so funny in like any type of practice scenario for you to, to ever, like anytime you feel like offended or like lash out at something like that, it's, it's mostly, per- it's mostly personal, you know, like <laughs> yeah. I'm never going to take offense to someone else <laughs> feeling good and like wanting to work harder, you know, like what kind of person am I to be like, no, sorry, like be be a little bit more lazy today. Like, don't, don't do that. I I think it's just like, if that's your zone and then that's how you get better, I'm all for it. Um, I think mostly it's just like, 
Um, I like like Jerry has this thing where he says, you know, like some days you're going to be, you know, you're going to feel really good. And, and that's the day, you know, relish that day because it doesn't happen every day. Some days you're going to have to work for some person, for some people, they're going to be floating at the front and you're going to be working really hard. And, and, you know, you don't not work hard. You don't give up on, you know, the rep or the workout because you're having to work a little bit harder than someone you reframe it for yourself. You know, it's just like, this is this easy day for someone else. Like don't obsess over the fact that it's easy for them. Like obsess over the fact that like, what do you have to do in your work to make this possible for you? Um, so I, I think it's, I'm literally never thinking about anybody else at practice. Cause I need all, everything I need is I need it for me. <laughs> like I've got to just soak up everything so that I can get through. Uh, and you know, like, I want to be able to like contribute and um, I want to be able to contribute to the team and like shovel some of the work. I also want to be able to contribute to myself. And then that means I'm not getting upset over somebody else's the way somebody else's feels, you know, like it's like, think of it as an emotion. Like if I were mad, somebody else was mad. Like, I don't know. That's, that seems kind of childish. Like (laughs) I'm not gonna, I I wouldn't go there. So of course it sucks. You know, you want to be the person feeling good every day um but that's just not the way it is for and I'll just you know I put a little asterisk that it's like there will will be a day I'll you know you'll get there eventually just have to kind of constantly reframe until you do um so that's usually if I'm getting dragged along I'm just like reframe you know (laughs) don't take it out on the person um just like (laughs) take it out on the rep or you know whatever you're whatever's next sure um Marielle, I'd love to kind of uh, change tact a bit here. I wanted to talk a little bit about the piece you wrote recently for Runner's World. Um, if anybody hasn't seen that, we will link to that in the show notes. It's called Racing to Stay Alive. Um, and it's 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 a beautifully written and, and a really impactful piece about um, racial inequality in the US and also how that plays into running and everything that's going on in the US right now. Um, it, when the article came out, it, it, it feels like it, it was everywhere, you know, in, in runners all over the world were, were talking about it. Um, how did you find, how was the reaction to that, uh, that article for you? Um, it was good. I, I definitely had a moment at altitude camp where I like went to my room and like, I realized everyone around me was reading it. <laughs> and I like, <laughs> I went to my room and I was like, you know, had a quick cry. Cause I was like, what have I done? <laughs> uh, that kind of situation where I was like a little bit overwhelmed. I think I, um, definitely grateful for that outlet. Cause it really helped. Uh, I mean, I was obviously thinking about it a lot like I was thinking about all of these all the themes that were in the piece of racial inequality police brutality um like activism and sport like I was thinking about all those things but I wasn't necessarily like uh I I don't know that I was like dealing with them active like I would do a little I would write and then I'd be like all right you know go run Mm -hmm. and it was that it was that kind of thing um and um I feel like when it came out, it kind of had made me have to confront it in like every aspect of my life where before it was more of just like a little person, like something that I was dealing with personally um, and then had to deal with publicly and like with with teammates, with family, like all that sort of thing. So um, that I I wasn't quite ready for um, (laughs) for for that. I didn't think that hard through. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, it was, um, it was definitely most all positive feedback. It's just, um, different to have to, uh, I guess, work through very heavy, um, topics with, um, with people you're not used to having to work through those type of things with. I think I'd kind of compartmentalized friendships and running and, um, my experiences, so much more so that I realized. And I think this kind of made me, or I think I'm not, definitely not the only person. I think we've seen it worldwide. We, we've we all kind of shifted things so, so we can see things when we want to and kind of close the door when we have to. And I think just all this year has really um, 
made a lot of people have to revisit their lives and their friendships and their community. And that's, that's self-work is hard work to do. (laughs) It's constant. Um, and, and so that, that was, um, I wasn't necessarily prepared for, for that, uh, that aspect of it. But again, I don't think anyone was, I think nobody still is. We're all kind of figuring out how to rework ourselves into this new normal, uh, situation. Um, Marielle, I'd love to read a short excerpt from the article that kind of, I mean, it, it was it was all obviously really impactful, but a piece that really kind of connected, um, I connected with, you wrote, here is my reality. I'm going running tomorrow. I'm not afraid to go running, but it feels inconceivable that I even have to think about it. It's even more frightening that there will be people who don't run tomorrow, who will tell their kids not to run tomorrow or whose families will sit at home wondering if their loved ones will return home. Now, Obviously, that was written um, partly in response to the the killing of Ahmed Arbery in Atlanta in uh, at the end of Feb, and that's like that's something that I grapple with because we're hearing all over the world that there's a running boom right now, right? Because of because of COVID, people are you know their their other traditional sports have closed down, all their gyms have shut, so everybody's out running, and certainly um, here in Melbourne, Australia, I see that, and a lot of people around the world see that, but the reality is it's only a running boom for some of us, right? Because there is still these massive parts of the community who like, it feels so crazy to say, but running is not a safe, um, safe sport or a safe activity for those people. Um, and you, you know, through, through the nature of, of this article and obviously your position and and where you are and who you are, do, do you feel, um, do you feel like a role model to, to helping sort of push that representation forward? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I can only like the biggest service I can do to anyone else is to do a service to myself, which is, you know, to stay committed to the things that I believe in. And I think there's a lot of, um, um, power and, you know, the protests are extremely important. You know, the people that are, are mentoring people, mentoring through, um, you know, suggesting academic works and um, pro- providing this lens for people to rethink things. I think all of that's important. Um, but I don't want to feel obligated to become an expert on race relations. You know, that that's not my <laughs> that, that's yeah. not my my lane, or that that's not where I feel confident in. But I I think there's as much power in like a musician making music during this time, or just somebody going to like working during this time, um, providing assistance, educators, athletes, like, I think it's very powerful to see them demonstrating that they're going to continue to, um, pursue their dreams and, you know, wholeheartedly be themselves, um, wear the things they want to wear. Um, I, I think that is, uh, with all of the ways we've seen there can be restraint on people of color in the, in particularly this country, also around the world. I think it's very powerful to just like assert yourself as you are and stay committed to those, um, to who you are and, and what you want. So I, I feel more confident in, in, in trying to do that, that then I would say like, uh, you know, being an expert or, um, you know, showing up in a way that would like, quote unquote, be, be a role model. I, I, I I feel more confident in my ability to do, um, you know, to say that, you know, like I am, uh, you know, a member of of the Bowerman Track Club. Like these are my goals for the year. This is how I'm going to demonstrate that I'm doing it. This is this is who I am and what I'm doing. Um, So I feel like that that's what I can do. That's where my effort is. Um, But I also have like immense gratitude and uh, just I am, I'm also learning from people, like from the people out there, right? Like I, I don't know all of the books. I haven't seen all of the movies. Um, so, so I really appreciative of the people that are taking up that space and doing that work. I, I just don't know that I can necessarily fill that particular void. So I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Um, you also recently, you did a great, uh, I watched on YouTube, actually a great podcast. You did, uh, the two black runners podcast was oh, yeah. like, <laughs> super entertaining. So, um, we'll share that in the show notes. 
and you're also doing a bit with Run Girl Co., which is aimed at, um, you know, increasing representation and, and helping encourage um, more black Americans to get out and start running. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, conversation with two black runners, I'm, I'm, you know, a fan of them. I'm proud of, of them for, for establishing themselves and, and really working to make, to uh, create a space for them in, in running world. Um, I, I don't think we're, ever going to not need new creative voices in a sport that we're trying to uh grow a fan and knowledge base of you know like bring in the ideas bring in the new faces that's always going to be helpful and and run girl co is um like a project i'm personally really proud to be a part of um i think it like serves as a as a base of information for for people who may not see um, themselves represented in that base of information that's already out there. You know, there's a lot of tips, tips to get started and, um, you know, core, what to eat. Um, there's a lot of information out there, but, um, it's not necessarily tailored to, um, um, black women. And when you're first starting out something, you, I think you kind of need that small scope, right? Like once you've immersed yourself in the running world and you like, you know what it's about, you know how to train, you know what to do, then you can like pick and choose and you you can have new voices. But um, I think we're learning that it is really important. A lot of us talking about how we entered into the sport, it was because we had the opportunity to, you know, talk to and be with people that looked like us and, and, you know, had similar passion for something. Um, so when you see that and you can build a community off of it, I, I think it's gonna, um, hopefully will be like, it, it can be encouraging. And I think run girl has really, um, is, is really tackling, t- trying to tackle that space of just, you know, um, getting people, s- not letting, um, the lack of representation be the reason you don't get started, right? Uh, Just because it Mm. feels scary and different. um, You don't close the door on on an incredible opportunity. And, um, you know, I know personally what, how like special and unique the running community is. And it's just hoping to bring more people through that door um, so that they can like, once, you know, they have this small lens and they, you get through the door, it can open up and and you can see just how dynamic um, it can be, um, but you have to get started to do that. Right. And I think like run girl is definitely like home base, um, for black women, um, to get started. Yeah. Uh, a couple of fun ones to finish off. Mm -hmm. You're, you're obviously spending a lot of time on camps where you got to sort of entertain yourself in the downtime, your YouTube history. What are we, what sort of videos are we seeing in there? What are you, what are you watching in your downtime? (laughs) Um, I've been watching a lot of, uh, bubble videos, <laughs> um, from just NBA training camps, Same. Stu- yeah. stupidity, but highly entertaining. <laughs> um, lots of bubble you know, videos. I kind of, I kind of like the, uh, you know, all the, all the food they get, like it, that kind of feels like a bit of a dream that their food is just there ready for them all the time in the bubble. But the food doesn't look good. It's no. not the highest quality, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, this is um bare bare basics. But no, it was it does look top notch, like an experience for if yeah. anything. Like they will <laughs> they will remember this time. <laughs> um so yeah, just just seeing just watching a lot of um bubble um videos. Um I feel like that's I watch Song Association a ton because I think that's fun. <laughs> Uh, and that's as far as I'll go in my history. <laughs> I feel like wow, that's okay, the, the, the... Okay. All right. Um, what's your, in, in the off season, you've just had a couple of weeks in the off season, downtime, sitting on the couch at night. What's your favorite snack food? Favorite snack food. Summer has been really into popsicles, like the like fruit. Uh, those are, those are my go-tos. Popcorn. Every been watching a, too much TV, so lots of popcorn. Um, I haven't had a summer s'more yet, which we're on August, the Sunday of summer, <laughs> so I really need to pick up the pace on that and have my ideal, you know, graham cracker, chocolate, marshmallow situation, so I can, you know, send off summer in style. That that right. hasn't been a staple, but I wish it was, and I'm gonna try and make it for the last few weeks we have left here. <laughs> Um, 
now that you're at camp again and you'll be joined by teammates in the in the coming days on those long runs we we inevitably on a long run we kind of end up paired up next to someone and and that's where you spend or who you spend the bulk of your time with on the long run chatting who's the who's like the ideal person to be next to on a long run hmm See, like, I love a good argument, so I'm trying to think of, like, who's the best (laughs) arguer. (laughs) But um, I would say Shelby is always bringing up these, like, life, these, you know, burn a hole through your chest life questions that you're, that I'm not always ready for. And I feel (laughs) like I get stuck with, not stuck, I like running with Shelby on long runs. But I'm always just like, we're going to talk about, you know, our, you know, biggest failure right now like you know mile 11 that's <laughs> that's yeah, what no she wants you. to yeah but she loves the big the big question the big life question so she's the good she usually gets long run Elise Cranny is also sneak attack will get you to talk about your entire life and you don't know how you got there but she just rolls out the questions gets deep very quickly and you know it's like we were just talking about I don't know, something very, something very light. And now all of a sudden we've, we've hit the, we've hit the rabbit hole. So I feel like those are, those are two, those are two, um, two good people. If if you're, if you want the, the deep dives for the long run. All right. Last question. Now this might be a bit easier for you as a, as a, as a distance runner, but, um, if you could only run in one pair of shoes for all of 2021, so you got to do like your speed workouts, your long runs, everything, and you've got to race in them as well. One pair of shoes. What are you choosing? I'm going peg turbos. Oh, okay. Yeah. Versatile. That's, that's, that feels like my best bet, <laughs> especially if we're going down to racing, you know, it's like, Good support, still light on the foot, like got a little bounce to it. Could be good on the track or the road. I feel like that that's really my best. Uh, yeah, it's my best bet. Yeah, that's a that's actually a great answer. That's good. <laughs> um, Marielle, that's that's us for today. I just want to cool. thank you again for jumping on the Running Things podcast. And uh, hey, for whatever twenty twenty has in store for us next, we uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed that chat with Marielle Hall. I found it really, um, really great that there was some relatable stuff for amateur runners around, um, you know, sometimes in training, it's just about running your own pace and not getting sort of swept along and, or sucked into what the group is doing. And also really interesting to hear about those, those doubts that can come into a race, like not letting the race happen around you, like, like taking control and not being stuck in the mindset of, well, this person is usually in front of me or, or this is where I should be in the race. So that was really interesting to hear from Marielle. And of course, those links that we spoke about during the episode, her article with Runners World, the Two Black Runners podcast, those are in the show notes. So make sure you go and check those out if you want any further reading on those topics. Next up on the show, we're going to take this off road. We're going to get a little bit dirty. We're going to sleep under the stars. We are chatting with Nike trail runner, OG trail athlete, actually, the great David Laney is joining us on the show. David is uh, super charismatic. He's a ball of fun. So I'm really looking forward to chatting with him. If you haven't, if you're not familiar with David, you want to jump on his Instagram, you just search him, David Laney. Um, been sharing a lot of really great tips for people looking to get into trail running or people looking to get into running in general um, and a lot of humor mixed in there as well. So get familiar with David before next week's show. It's going to be a great one. Until next time, guys, thank you so much for being here with us and uh, take your easy days easy. Thank you so much for watching Running Things. We're over here working hard to bring you guys the very best content we can and it's all free. So do us a favor and hit that subscribe button below and share Running Things with your friends as well. You can also cop us as a podcast wherever you get your pods, search Running Things. If you want to read the latest and greatest long form storytelling with the best imagery in the running world, head to tempojournal.com. If you haven't yet found us on Instagram, it's a heck of a place to be. Search at Tempo Journal and you will find us there.